So um, how the hell does this relate to AI and to intelligence amplification, which basically means taking computers and using them to extend our intelligences as we discussed, and brain-computer interfaces in particular. How is this connected? So we go back to our, um, our catchphrase. We want to build interfaces that engage with many parts of the human mind, at, uh, at the human nervous system at high throughput. I made this bold, OK? Um, I, you know. Uh, <laughs> why? Why? Why did I make this bold? Um, I made it bold because uh, if, if we achieve this, the, the, the previous slide, then we can keep humans relevant into the next era of computing, OK? Keep them in the driving seat. And I know that uh, there's, there's been some, some nice activity here at the center um, uh, uh, engaging on this topic of is artificial intelligence dangerous? Um, and I want to show you how using neurohumanistic technology we could actually solve this problem <coughs> or at least come a little bit closer to a solution. So let me get set up here while you read that quote. So I want to read you guys a quote from Nick Bostrom, uh, a professor of philosophy at Oxford, a uh, computational neuroscientist, really, really amazing writer and thinker, and I, and I would encourage all of you guys to engage with him. He's a buddy of Elon's, and, um, and th they think in the same uh, fashion about this. I'm going to read you guys an excerpt from his book, the opening uh, part of his book. The unfinished fable of the sparrows. It was nest building season. After days of uh, long hard work, the sparrows sat in the evening glow, relaxing and chirping away. We are all so small and weak. Imagine how easy life could be if we had an owl uh, who could help us build our nests. Yes, said another. And we could use it uh, to look after our elderly and our young. It could give us advice and keep an eye out for the neighboring cat, added a third. Then Pastus, the elder, elder bird, spoke. Let us send out scouts in all directions and try to find an abandoned owlet somewhere, or maybe an egg. A crow, might chick, uh, 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 a crow chick might also do, or a baby weasel. This could be the best thing that ever happened to us, at least since the opening of the pavilion of unlimited grain in yonder backyard. Not a very funny writer. The flock was exhilarated, and the sparrows everywhere started chirping at the top of their lungs. Only Skronkfinkel, a one-eyed sparrow, <laughs> I love the imagery, uh, a one-eyed sparrow with a fretful temperament was unconvinced of the wisdom of the endeavor. Quoth he, this will surely be our undoing. Should we not give some thought to the out of owl domestication and owl taming first before we bring such a creature into our midst. Replied Pastus, taming an owl sounds like an exceedingly difficult thing to do. It would be difficult enough to find an owl egg. Let's start there. And after we've succeeded in raising an owl, then we could think about taking on this other challenge. There is a flaw in that plan, squeaked Skronkfinkel, but his protests were in vain, as the flock had already lifted off to start implementing in the, uh, the directive set out by Pastus. Just two or three sparrows remained behind. Together, they began to try to work out how owls might be tamed or domesticated. They soon realized that Pastus had been right. This was an exceedingly diffi difficult challenge, especially in the absence of an actual owl to practice on. Nevertheless, they uh, pressed on as best as they could, constantly fearing that the flock might return with an owl egg before a solution to the control problem had been found. It is not known how the story ends, but the author dedicates this book to Strong Finkel and his followers. So that is uh, the introduction to this this book, and I think you know I think it's it's a good way to understand uh, uh, that a lot of people, a lot of really wonderful thinkers, are getting concerned with this topic right now. Here's a few: Elon Musk, you may have seen his tweet. Uh, Hope we're not biological bootloader for digital superintelligence. Unfortunately, that is increasingly probable. Since then, he sent out a lot of other tweets that were even more engaged in this topic. He donated $10 million for research for it. Um, 
Peter, we'll talk about Peter Thiel in a moment, but uh, Stephen Hawking joined this movement as well. Um, and since I, since I actually created this, uh, this presentation for the previous generation of you guys, um, and it's becoming a more and more kind of mainstream uh, way of thought. So these are a lot of people who I trust and who I really uh, like. Peter Thiel, this is the continuum he, uh, he draws. This is the level of intelligence of a mouse, okay, and a moron. So this is your kind of, your, your initial image that he wants you to, to have in your mind. And he shows how the intelligence of a moron and Einstein, okay, are this close to each other and how a super intelligence is going to be way, way out there and even further. And this is something that is a lot more provable, okay? So when you have a computer that makes the relationship between you and a mouse seem so feeble, right? That places us in, in you know, by metaphor, we're as smart as a cockroach relative to this thing, okay? And um, our friend Peter Thiel argues that when that kind of a thing happens, it's not, the question should not be how this interface can help my life, how it's going to help me do my dishes and drive me around. The question is a political uh, question. It's almost as if, it's a question that you'd ask if an if a alien came down to earth, he says. Um, it's, do they come in peace? And that is that is the th that is the message of this here. Yes. How are you? Good. I'm just. We're actually the students have to kind of get moving over across the street soon. So. Okay. How how many minutes do I have? Um, just about a minute and a half. A minute and a half. All right. So let me, let me jump to the end. Um, so that is uh, what Peter Thiel feels about the problem, and this is uh, this is a. Uh, Gary Kasparov losing to a, a, chess, uh, a chess AI in 1997. No one thought this was going to be possible. This guy's the only happy guy in the crowd. Um, and uh, this is where neurohumanism kicks into this problem. We aim to uh, augment intelligence using these kind of interfaces. So when you wear the meta glasses, you'll be connected to lots of intelligence amplification. Um, and uh, this is a uh, quote that Bog McGraw from Palantir says, but what is the best entity that plays chess? It turns out that it's not a computer. Uh, decent human players paired with computers actually beat humans and computers playing alone. So um, our mission is to uh, amplify intelligence um, and using what we call weak or specialized artificial intelligence connected to the human mind through things like glasses or computers <coughs> or BCI, we believe this can be achieved. And so we wanna build, you know, we wanna connect meta and a little bit of uh, artificial intelligence, right, Jarvis. Um, and together, uh, we think we can, uh, we can create a really cool thing for the future. So that's, uh, that's my, uh, my spiel. Thank you very much.